Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Nicholas Parker, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Montreal this evening. I got here uh, by riding my bike uh, to the Billy Bishop Island Airport this morning, uh, not looking quite like this, and then taking a flight to Montreal and then sharing an Uber uh, into the city. And I've been walking around all afternoon, getting soaked, uh, but enjoying uh, being here in Montreal. So uh, here we are in autumn, and uh, on my way here, I was thinking about the summer that I had, and I had a kind of a reset moment this summer, uh, because like everybody here, I was completely and utterly dialed into the World Geological Congress taking place in Cape Town. <laughs> now this happened at the same time as the Rio Olympics, so in case you didn't have two screens, um, I'll try and remind you of what happened at the World Geological Congress, because what happened there flows into what I want to share with you about why we as Canadians have to engage with China on the mother of all opportunities, which is around uh, their epic transition to a clean energy uh, economy. So what happened in Cape Town this summer was something that uh, hasn't happened in 12,000 years, and that was the official uh, announcement by the world's geologists that we're now into what they call the Anthropocene era. What does that mean? It means that human beings are now the geological force of nature. In 10,000 years, we've come out of our caves and we've accomplished what we can all see we've accomplished. In fact, we can even uh, find planets light years, trillions of light years away from our Earth. But at the same time, here we are in a world of 400 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere, the most we've ever seen in over 100,000 years of geological knowledge. Uh, we're moving into a world of three degree uh, temperature change, despite the heroic, uh, if uh, failed, efforts of our leaders in Paris at the COP21 summit last November. So here we are, hurtling into our future at ever increasing velocity and climate instability. So my uh, few more minutes up here on the stage is to tell, share with you my view that China will be the epicenter of whether we make it through this crisis that we're in uh, and whether the Anthropocene era actually delivers uh, the abundance that we all seek. So why is China so important? Well. Uh, China, as many of us already know, is the world's largest carbon emitter already, uh, not per capita, by, but, but uh, in terms of overall CO2 emissions. Um, and I'm trying to make my PowerPoint work here for me. So China is a $10 trillion a year economy. It's taken 600 to 700 million people out of poverty in a, just over a generation but it's 1.4 billion people whose uh, annual emissions of CO2 since 1960 has gone up by nearly 5% a year. This means that China now is losing up to 6% of its GDP to environmental pollution. Now, it's not just climate pollution, it's water, food, uh, and everything else, but all of them are closely interrelated. China, 60% uh, of the groundwater in China is polluted, 20% of the land uh, is, is gone, and uh, over 360 cities are now considered uh, out of bounds in terms of what the Chinese call the air apocalypse. At the same time, there's something rather dramatic happening in China in terms of the people's awareness. Uh, a documentary in China last year in 2015 called Under the Dome, which was kind of the Chinese version of uh, The Inconvenient Truth. When it went out in Tencent, which is their uh, YouTube, it had 200 million views within, within a week. In fact, within three days before it was taken down by the authorities. But those same authorities have now embraced the need for change. Uh, China's leadership, which came into power in 2012, announced that China would now do what it had done for uh, poverty alleviation. It would do the same thing to the environment. And whether or not we like the system in China, most of us would accept that when the Chinese say they're going to do something, they generally get it done, and they generally get it done ahead of schedule. 
China announced in June that it would cancel all new coal-fired plants, all new coal-fired plants, including those that already have approvals. China has announced that it will spend 6.6 .6 trillion US dollars on combating climate change over the next 15 years. And we, at our group, think that this translates into an annual market of over $660 billion a year uh, in terms of clean tech and so on. The current five-year plan, which guides everything in China, uh, known as 13-5, because it's the 13th five-year plan, uh, is built on the notion of the circular economy. In other words, industrial ecology and what is waste will get converted into usable uh, products. And I'll come back to that. But that's, these are just headlines that don't necessarily tell you the deeper transformation that's taking place in China as it pivots away uh, from where it's uh, been for the last 20, 25, 30 years to a service based economy, a consumer-based economy, uh, an innovation-based economy. And so this is changing the climate around corruption. Uh, nearly 500,000 officials have been punished in the last two years, including for not enforcing environmental regulations, which with the new law uh, means that the uh, key performance indicators of all public officials are now tied to environmental uh, agenda as well as uh, economic uh, dividends. China is also moving to address the, the challenges it's had around intellectual property and intellectual property protection and now has uh, legal courts focused on this. In fact, there were more domestic IP lawsuits in China in 2014 than there were in the, in the United States. So China is getting serious about this and many other things. So here we are. China has already ratified the, the climate change agreement uh, agreed in Paris last year, and of course Canada has just done so the same. China is also launching a cap and trade uh, system, um, pardon me, also launching a cap and trade system un, uh, similar to Ontario and Quebec. So what does this mean for Canada? If China is a $600 billion a year market, and we're only exporting uh, roughly $6 billion dollars worth of environmental services and goods a year. This clearly is where the puck is going. China invested last year 325 billion in renewable, uh, uh, the globe, the world invested last year 325 billion in renewable energy, of which a third was invested in China. So this is a huge opportunity for us. It's the mother of all markets. And I believe that as Canadians, we need to get together on this one, even if we have difficulties with many other aspects of where China is going as a society. So where do we stand right now? We're losing global market share in terms of clean tech exports. Uh, the numbers have declined year on year uh, for the last decade. Uh, and yet, uh, we have institutions like SDTC, like uh, Mars in Toronto and elsewhere which are incubating Canadian companies which are now ready for prime time. In Toronto, where I live, we have the largest Chinese population in the world outside of Asia, 1.4 million people of Chinese heritage. We had 250,000 tourists in Toronto alone from China last year. China's paying attention to us. There are several areas where I think we can win and we can collaborate and where China can help us solve challenges that we have, not just ones that they have. And I would just leave you with three quick examples. One is, how do we take CO2 from being a waste into something that's valuable? So we can do this. We can have green cement, and there's companies like Carbon Cure in Halifax. We can take CO2 and methane and convert that into plastics that can be used to make computers and mobile phones. We can do many things like this, and we have a lot of green uh, chemistry know-how in Canada that the Chinese are interested in. The opportunity I'm most interested in this part of the world, in Quebec and Ontario, is around smart mobility. We have companies like Magna, we have companies like Bombardier, we have startups, several of which have already been mentioned. The Chinese are looking to develop integrated smart mobility systems. So are we in Montreal and Toronto and points in between. We can collaborate with the Chinese to export our stuff, to import their stuff, to cross-invest, 
and to win uh, in, a, in a mutually beneficial way. So there are many other companies, there are many other examples. Energy storage would be one of them, and companies have already been mentioned here today. My colleague, Ken Strong, the son of Maurice Strong, who uh, pioneered Canada's relations with China, is actually in China this week with a company that's been mentioned twice, if not three times, Morgan Solar, uh, for what we hope will turn out to be a groundbreaking deal. So as it turns out, our Prime Minister is taking China seriously. Uh, it's challenging for him right now because we have quite divergent views in this country about how we should play with China. But I think we can all agree that climate change and clean tech is a win-win space for all of us. And my recommendation to, to all of us here is we need to build on the declaration announced in February of this year between China and Canada to cooperate on clean tech to have a grand bargain over 20, 25 years for a global green partnership where we can help each other and we can also go into other countries and other parts of the world, whether it's Africa or across the Silk Road, where we can combine our assets with the Chinese to create a planet that's worth living on and makes the Anthropocene era uh, an era rather than of scarcity, but one of abundance, inclusion, and joint prosperity. Thank you. Thank you.